what I want to try to do today is use game theoretic reasoning to help us understand, to use a term I'm not fond of, how Europe became exceptional. That is, how it was that Europe became politically freer and economically more prosperous than the rest of the world for a very long time. And it is my conviction that the standard answers to those puzzles are, to put it m modestly, completely incorrect. And I'm going to offer an alternative. So it is the Hayek lecture, so I did think it was important to pay homage to Friedrich Hayek, who observed that the spiritual and temporal are different spheres which ought not to be confused, which, as we will see, is something that this talk is as well about. I'm interested in the relationship between the secularization of Europe and Europe's economic development and how those two things were the strategic consequences of the relationship between the Catholic Church and politics in the guise of the interests of the Holy Roman Emperor and a bunch of kings. I'm going to focus on an incentives-oriented approach as it was restructured by the Concordat of Worms. I imagine most people are not familiar with the Con Concordat of Worms. I will tell you about it in, in time. Uh, it's an event that occurs after the investiture controversy, which starts somewhere between 1035 and 1046, depending upon your point of view. What did Worms do in a nutshell? Worms increased the bargaining power of secular rulers, especially kings, in wealthy dioceses, right? The Catholic Church is divided up into dioceses. So in wealthy dioceses, kings gained bargaining leverage. In poor dioceses, the pope or the church gained leverage. And a consequence of that was a wedge was created between the interests of the church in economic development and prosperity and the interests of secular rulers. Secular rulers became motivated to make more of their territory prosperous and the church became motivated to limit that prosperity or even reduce it. And so we're going to see that the Concordat created an economic linkage or a linkage between the rise of secular politics in Europe and the rise of economic development, something which surprisingly, as far as I know, no historian has observed, nor has anybody studying the political economy of this period. The standard accounts, which look at things like the Protestant Reformation and so forth, we will see are all strategic consequences of the Concordat. So Worms created the conditions under which Northern Europe, which was poorer than Southern Europe at the time, becomes much richer and Southern Europe fails to become richer, creating what is now the modern division between Northern, mostly Protestant Europe, which is more prosperous, than today's mostly Catholic Southern Europe. This touches on a lot of broad themes. Uh, so just so you know, I've read some literature. Um, you know, this is relevant to the literature on political institutions and uh, development, political and economic development. Uh, it is relevant to the emergence of the modern sovereign state, which most people think uh, is launched by the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. I think that's wrong. Many of the ingredients of the sovereign state are in place immediately upon the signing of the Concordat of Worms. And we can, I'll talk a little bit about that. We can talk more about it in the Q&A. There's a large literature on the spread of secularism. Most of that literature is, begins its focus about 500 years too late. Begins with the period of Martin Luther. And there's a large literature on the linkage between religion and economic development. So this touches on all of those subjects. 
All right, a little bit of brief historical background. In 1035, a guy was elected as pope, took the title of Benedict IX. He was a member of the Tusculum family, which ran Rome. And you know how some people are known as uh, you know, Catherine the Great or Saint Gregory? Well, Benedict also had an appellation attached to his regular name, <laughs> Benedict the Wicked. Historians argue about how old Benedict was when he became pope. The consensus is he was 20. There is a significant minority that says he was 12. Either way, either way, he was a man with no religious calling, no experience in religion. Of course, he was Catholic. He was not a priest. He, he was just this guy that the Tusculum family wanted to be pope because the papacy was a really valuable position, controlled an awful lot of money and power. So he becomes pope. Another family, unhappy that the rigged election produced Benedict, they produced their own guy, Stephen, I forget, maybe the second. Stephen chases Benedict out of Rome. Benedict runs away. He gets a little army, he comes back, he chases Stephen out of Rome. Stephen never comes back. And then Benedict goes to his godfather, Gratian. This is now about 1046. And he says to his godfather, I'm paraphrasing, we don't have a recording. You know, this pope job, I'm tired of it. I want to get married. They're telling me I, I can't get married. It's not proper. Can I resign? And his godfather, a religious man, says, well, popes have resigned in the past. Popes resign when they're sent to the salt mines to die and they want to protect the church and have somebody taking care of it. That doesn't seem to be your circumstance. So it's really not proper for you to resign. And besides, it's not smart. The papacy is a really powerful and valuable position. It's worth a tremendous amount of money. You shouldn't resign. You should sell it. <laughs> I'll buy it. And so he sells the papacy to Grotin. We have the records of how much was paid and so forth. And you know, you can imagine this was not well received. So the church now is divided. Is this OK? I don't think it's OK. And they don't know what to do. They're trying to figure out, how do you remove a pope who, after all, on the one hand, has bought the papacy. On the other hand, the pope is God's choice. You know, it's God's will. So the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry III, says, hey, hey wait a minute. As it turns out, you know, like the pope, I have been chosen by God. And I think we need to get rid of this guy. So he calls a, a conference. He deposes Gratian, and he imposes Sudger, who is a bishop from Bamburg in Germany. The Holy Roman Emperor is German. We get the first German pope. So the Holy Roman Emperor has figured out, I can step in, and I can choose who should be the pope. And he thinks that's great. The church is really upset about who has the authority to pick the pope. And unfortunately for Henry, Sudger turns out not to be that good a choice. It turns out that he is a reformer. He thinks that they need to standardize and routinize and normalize the process of the selection of bishops and popes and take it out of the hands of the Holy Roman Emperor who made him bishop. Well, Sudger, like most people at the time, liked a glass of wine. Uh, he particularly liked, he was German, he liked German red wine. I am not suggesting anything untoward. I will just note that shortly after he became pope, he died of lead poisoning. Um, German wine had lead in it. An autopsy has been done the, the um, recently. The amount of lead in Sudger's remains is in great excess 
of the amount of lead normally in red wine in Germany of the time. So now a battle ensues over who should choose the leaders of the Catholic Church. This is called the investiture struggle or the investiture controversy. Who will invest bishops? And this gets resolved approximately 80 years later in 1122. There's a little side deal beforehand in England, the Concordat of London in 1106. What are the basic terms of the deal? The basic deal is that the church or the pope will appoint bishops in the sense that he will nominate bishops. And the Holy Roman Emperor or his local secular agent, the local <coughs> king, the local duke, whatever, will get to say yes or no, has a veto. And if he says yes, bishop is installed. And if he says no, the secular ruler over the diocese gets to keep the revenue of the diocese until the pope comes up with somebody who is acceptable to that ruler. Now this is a huge change in church policy. It is the big change that will drive much of my story. In 451 at the Council of Chalcedon, I was there, it was very interesting, <laughs> the church passed a bunch of canons. Canon 25, laws, canon 25 said that when a bishopric, a see, a diocese is vacant, the income from the diocese will be administered by the church manager of the money on behalf of the church. And what the deal at Verm says is, no, 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 the money will go to the, the ruler, the secular ruler. The money will be held by the church in fief from the secular ruler, only when a bishop is agreed to. Now before this, bishops were chosen by lots of ways. There was choice by clero et populo, by the clergy or the people. There were choices by the metropolitan bishop, what today we would call an archbishop. Uh, there were bishoprics were sold, there was simony, uh, local rulers would pick guys. To, it was all over the place. There was no regular system. So, what Worms did is it regularized the process. We're going to look game theoretically at the deal at Worms, and I want you to understand it's going to produce three equilibrium outcomes. The third equilibrium outcome is achieved in the case of the French by 1309 during the Avignon Papacy. So after 1309, as I'll explain in a bit, things get murkier in estimating certain elements of the theory because we can no longer tell the difference between bishops who are the choice of the French king and bishops who are the choice of the church because the church is controlled by the French king. All right, so how does bishop selection work under the Concordat? So the, the church nominates a bishop, it's going to fill a vacancy. Henry V signs the, the deal with Calixtus, the second pope. Calixtus says, I, Henry, by the grace of God, august emperor of the Romans, do remit to God that in all the churches that are in my kingdom, meaning all of what is today Germany, much of what is today France, much of what is today Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, so forth. By the grace of God, right, in do remit to God in all the churches in my kingdom or empire, there may be canonical election and free consecration. Sounds like he's just saying, all right, you guys pick bishops and it's, that's fine, it's all done. Except the other part is, he gets to say yes or no. If any discord shall arise, thou, the king, mayest give consent and aid to the party which has the more right. And which party has the more right? The one the king says has the more right. That is, if he doesn't like who the pope is nominated, he can compel the pope to come up with somebody he's going to say yes to. If accepted, nominee 
is invested as the bishop. By the way, this is no small thing. The one elected, moreover, without any exaction, nonsense, may receive the regalia from thee, and all investiture shall be through ring and staff, also on lance. So what is the deal? The deal is when the person is invested, they get the regalia. What is the regalia? It is the right, among other things, to the revenue of the diocese on loan from the king until the bishop dies and the see is vacant. And what does the new bishop have to agree to, and the pope has to agree to, for this regalia to be transferred? He has to agree, the bishop has to swear homage and fealty to the local ruler or, or emperor. That is, that he is the secular ruler's vassal and that he will defend the secular ruler by the lance. He will fight for the ruler in the event that the ruler is attacked. So he acknowledges that he is the vassal of the king and that he will defend the king. There was a lot of objection to that among bishops. Um, I'm forgetting his name now. Adalbert of Brescia, for example, said, no, 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 this is going to enslave the church. But of course, it also means big flow of money. So the church resolves his objection. They hang him. Uh, <laughs> not heresy, because it wasn't heresy. So they don't burn him at the stake. They hang him. That, that took care of the objection. All right. So what does the game of worms look like, of worms? So I'm going to assume that I'm going to provide a simplified version of the game here. If you want to read the paper, um, there's, all the choices are made in a continuous type space. And um, there is uncertainty about how loyal a bishop the local ruler desires and so forth. Here I'm going to simplify it. So there are two types of bishops. Those expected to be loyal to the church and the pope, to the church's bidding, and those expected to be loyal to the secular ruler, do the secular ruler's bidding. So that when the policies of the church and the king clash, a religious, what I will call a religious bishop, will do what the pope wants, and the secular bishop will take the side of the king. Okay, so we have two types of bishops. I'm going to here assume the pope strictly prefers religiously aligned bishops, and the secular ruler strictly prefers secularly aligned bishops. In the full game, there's some uncertainty around that, makes, which is what creates an equilibrium, the possibility of interregna, which can't happen in the complete information game. And what do the payoffs look like? So if a religious person is selected as the bishop, the pope gets the bishop that he prefers, a religious guy, by which I don't mean the person's religious. I mean, you know, aligned with the Pope. Don't forget Benedict. Um, he gets a religious, a bishop aligned with him, and he gets the income from the diocese. And the king gets whatever utility he attaches to this bishop, which is not the person to his liking. If, on the other hand, a secular bishop is chosen, then the pope gets whatever utility he attaches to having this, from his point of view, inferior bishop, and he gets the money, and the king gets the bishop he prefers. Now, what if the king says no? So if the secular ruler rejects the nominee, then the pope gets whatever is the continuation value of the policies in place in the diocese. Whatever's been going on in the diocese is assumed to continue. And the king gets the income from the diocese, which he had assigned to the bishop in fief, while there is a bishop. Now there's no bishop, so the, the secular ruler gets the money. And in addition to the money, unfortunately for the secular ruler, otherwise this would not be an interesting strategic problem, the pope can make his life difficult. The pope can excommunicate the king. So if you die while you're excommunicated, this apparently is not good for your subsequent prospects of eternal salvation. The pope can interdict the bishop 
Interdiction means that you can deprive the people in the diocese of all or some of the sacraments. Typically, they didn't include the sacrament of baptism and of last rites. But for example, you couldn't get married because if you got married, you were getting married without the approval of the church. So it was an illegitimate marriage. Therefore, any child that was the product of that marriage was an illegitimate child and therefore was deprived of inheritance and all, all sorts of bad things. And sometimes they went further. Sometimes they banned everything. And they could deny a king's oaths. So when the pope was unhappy with King John in England's view of who should be the Archbishop of Canterbury, the, his first line of defense was to say, I forgive all who have sworn oaths of fealty to John. Those oaths are meaningless. And then we get Runnymede because now the barons are not constrained by the promises they have made. The pressure is on. John concedes to the pope, allows the Archbishop of Canterbury that the pope wants. Then the pope says, oh, no, 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 those, those oaths count. And no, no, this Magna Carta thing is ridiculous. And they renege on that deal. All right. So there are potential costs as well as benefits in saying no. So now the question is straightforward. Will a ruler say yes or no? There are three cases in this simplified <coughs> version of the game. It's you know, a continuum of choices in the regular game. Case one. The king prefers a secular ruler to a religious ruler, and the diocese has low enough income or small enough costs to offending the pope or both, or big enough costs, excuse me, that the king prefers a religiously aligned bishop to getting the money minus the costs. The second case is the income is higher or the expected costs are lower or some combination of the two. So the king prefers, of course, the secular bishop. But if not the secular bishop, he prefers to reject the nominee, have an interregnum, and get the money. Worst would be a religious bishop if the pope had nominated a religious bishop. And the third equilibrium is the diocese has become so wealthy that the king doesn't care about bishops. He doesn't have to trade political power for money. So in the second equilibrium, that's exactly what he will be doing because the pope will understand if I nominate a guy aligned with me, the king is going to say no and get the money. So I should choose somebody aligned with the king. I'll give the king more political power, control over this very important person, and in exchange, I'll get the dough. Well, if the diocese is really rich, the king can have the power and the money. He doesn't have to trade the two. So he's going to say no to whomever is nominated. That will be the Protestant Reformation. All right. <laughs> now you laugh, but I'm going to show you. So what are the implications? In a poor diocese, the income is better. As I said, Pope gets the guy he wants. Moderately wealthy diocese, the money's more attractive. The king gets the bishop he wants. In the wealthiest diocese, who needs the pope? All right, so I have data with which to test this. I have data on 572 Roman Catholic dioceses in Europe between the years 325 and 1700. You think that was easy? And I have data on of those 371 were covered by the deal, the remainder 200 and whatever were not covered. I've got some data on 12,000, over 12,000 bishops or bishop diocese pairs. Again, from 325, that's the Council of Nicaea, to Martin Luther. And I can measure the expected alignment of 2,727 bishops between 325 and 1517. So how do, I, how do I do that? So I ask a simple question. What was this bishop's job before he became bishop? So if he was a priest, an abbot, a monk, so forth, I assume that the church believed this person was going to be more aligned with them than with 
the secular ruler. And of course, they make mistakes, but that's what they would have believed. And if instead the bishop had been the king's chancellor, his ambassador, his tutor, his musician, if he worked for the secular ruler before becoming a bishop, I assume that he was expected to be aligned with the king, duke, whatever he was. Okay, so unfortunately the church does not yet provide more biographies than I have scanned. I've got this is as complete a data set as one can currently get, although they keep releasing information. So I've been able to assess this information and identify 2,183 2, bishops as being religiously aligned and 544 as being aligned with the secular ruler. And my concern in the paper I'm presenting today, I have much broader concerns, I'll touch on them as well a little bit, is whether there is a change in the character of people chosen as bishops as a function of verms having been signed and a crude measure of the wealth of a diocese. So how do I measure wealth? Wouldn't it be nice if somebody reported income levels or uh, products or something like that from 325? But they don't. But what they do report is, was a diocese on a major trade route or not? So through most of this period, people are living pretty much on subsistence farming. Farming begins to take off um, and trade routes begin to spread. So what I'm going to look at is whether I'm going to define a diocese as wealthy if it is on a major trade route. Now, obviously, that's going to be error prone. I'm pretty confident any diocese on a major trade route was wealthy, but I'm also confident that there were some not on a major trade route that were wealthy, and I just can't evaluate that. I'm, you know, some people suggest, why don't you use urbanization data, uh, like Bayrach or uh, there's Chandler, several different data sets. So the coverage in Bayrach's data starts in the year 800, and is by century, and is not linked to diocese, and has approximately 7% coverage for the diocese and diocesanal data. It's useless. And the uh, Chandler data is even smaller coverage. So unfortunately, can't be done. All right. I'm going to use to measure cost. Well, I don't know how religious these people were. You know, this is an age of religion and so on. I'm sure many of them truly believed, but I can't tell the difference between the, 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 the rulers who, who truly believed and those who acted as if they believed because it was prudent. Um, so I, I have no idea what their evaluation of cost is. But I do know something I, from the international relations conflict literature that I can apply. So if I assume that the religiosity of secular rulers is kind of uniformly distributed around everywhere, I know that projecting power is very difficult far from home. And I will offer some anecdotal evidence about that. So I'm going to assume that the farther we get from Rome, the lower the expected cost. Because the pope may indeed excommunicate you, but it's very hard to enforce that excommunication far from home. So, for example, <coughs> anecdotally, 29 would-be church reformers were burned at the stake between Worms and Martin Luther. 72% of them were living within 500 kilometers of Rome. Almost none of the people who were actually burned at the stake. Many were, they were well condemned, but those actually burned at the stake. Very few were far from Rome. Jan Hus is a clear example of an exception. Jan Hus was living in Prague, pretty far from Rome, but with, I, I do not mean to offend anybody, Jan Hus was an idiot. There was the Council of Constance going on in 1417 in Constance, Germany. The Pope was there. He says, hey, Jan, come, come to Constance. Explain to us your ideas. They sound interesting. 
you have free passage. You don't have to worry. We just want to hear an explanation of what you have to say. He goes to Constance. They arrest him. They burn him at the stake. <laughs> Martin Luther didn't make that mistake. He, too, was invited to come to Rome to explain to the pope what he was thinking. No, no thank you. All right. Let me contrast these guys with a couple of examples of heretics, convicted as heretics, people who were far from Rome. So John Wycliffe was in Oxford while he was busy preaching his Reformation, 1,869 kilometers from Rome. Peter Waldo was in Lyon, 995 kilometers from Rome, hard to get to him. Martin Luther was in Wittenberg, 1,410 kilometers from Rome. These guys were just as offensive to the Catholic Church as Savonarola and so forth, who were in Florence and were burned at the stake. These guys lived into their old age. It is true in the case of Wycliffe that eventually they dug up his bones. He had been dead for a long time. And they burned his bones at the stake. I'm going to guess that was not as unpleasant for him <laughs> as had they burned him. But what do I know? In any event, we see anecdotally, getting, getting yourself far away from Rome was a good way to avoid being arrested and burned. How did the church use punishment? So this is a graph starting with the first century, you know, right after Jesus, up through the 1500s. And I have divided people who were ex so these are people excommunicated by the church, consequential people, I've done, uh, by the pope, not by just local bishops, into three categories. They committed heresy according to the church. They were politically offensive, or there were other things, peccadillos. <laughs> they, they married somebody they were for, forbidden to marry, you know, incest, on, on child abuse, stuff that wouldn't happen today. So, what we see is Worms is right here. That's Worms. What we see is before Worms, there are the occasional peccadillos. Almost everybody who is excommunicated is excommunicated for their religious position. They are taking a heretical view of the Trinity, uh, transubstantiation, whatever things that Catholics care about. In the Worms to Avignon period, virtually all of the excommunications are motivated by politics. They're almost all kings, princes, other you know, dukes and other lords, whose offense is to tell the pope, don't tell me what to do. Not religious. The church is not claiming that they have behaved badly as Catholics. They are behaving badly as politicians in competition with the Pope. And then we get past the Avignon period, moving into the Protestant Reformation, and the political punishments are gone. All right. What is the interest in wealth, in, in, in wealth of rulers and popes? For rulers within this game theoretic model, wealth is strictly increasing their welfare. Because in a poor diocese, they have to accept a bishop. Bishops are very important people. They have to accept a bishop who will do whatever the pope wants. In a wealthier diocese, they have to give up money, but they will get a bishop who does what they want. Let me give you an example. Philip Augustus was king of France from 1179 to 1223. There were 83 bishops appointed during Philip's reign. Innocent III was the pope at the time, a very powerful pope. Interdicted Philip's territory because Philip wanted to marry somebody that the pope didn't want him to marry. And worse, Philip wanted to support as candidate for Holy Roman Emperor the guy the pope didn't want. So he interdicts his territory. That's essentially trying to foment a rebellion against him because people are being denied the sacraments. In the wealthier parts of France, two-thirds of the bishops during Philip's reign were blood relatives of Philip. 
in the poor diocese of France, two thirds of the bishops in the poor diocese came out of the Pope's court. Almost nobody was related to Philip. Philip's blood relatives all ignored the interdict. They all acted as if all of their authority was fully in place. In the poor diocese where the Pope's guys were bishops, they all obeyed the interdict. So this is a really big deal. So the king strictly wants greater wealth. By the way, this is a big change because now for the first time, kings have an incentive not just to generate wealth by conquering enemies or by marrying into money. They now have an incentive to generate money by making their subjects richer so they can tax them and take more of that money for themselves. Economic growth now gives them political control over their biggest rival, the Pope, the Catholic Church. The Pope's incentives are more complicated, so it depends upon how much the king values controlling policy over controlling money. That's why we have two graphs here, but they both tell the same story. The Pope has a non-linear, non-monotonic preference over wealth. He wants a diocese to be, become richer up to the dividing line between the first case, where the diocese is sufficiently poor, and the second case, where the king is going to get as bishop the guys he wants in exchange for the money. So that's a bad thing. So the optimal income, where that falls, depends on these other elements. But what the pope wants is optimal income is to limit the prosperity of a diocese. Because if it gets too rich, the pope has to give up too much political power. So what, let's look at some evidence and see, do these people actually respond to these changed equilibrium incentives? Or is, just this, is this just the wishful thinking of a modern, I like to think I'm modern, political scientist projecting onto these people in an age of, of superstition and so forth? So first graph, I'm going to look at the difference between the covered and the not covered diocese across Europe in the context of whether they were poor or rich. So these are rich dioceses, uh, poor dioceses, these are rich dioceses. And what I'm plotting is the percentage of the bishops covered minus not covered, not covered being the control group, they shouldn't be affected, who are religiously oriented. So what we see is in the poor diocese and the rich diocese, there's very little difference between covered and not covered before the investiture controversy begins to separate. During the Worms to Avignon interlude, the separation is huge. In the rich diocese, the difference in the alignment of bishops in the covered versus not covered diocese is huge. They are hardly any of them are religious. And in the secular diocese, and in the poor diocese, they're almost all religious. And then after Avignon, when you can no longer tell the difference between the expected alignment of a bishop, since after the Avignon papacy, the French king is picking the pope. And this continues. So the Avignon uh, papacy, in one sense, ends in 1376. The pope returns to Rome. Two years later, he's not happy. He's afraid of losing the papal states. That's why he's gone back. But now he's seeing that the people in Rome don't like the idea that the cardinals are all his guys, and they're not going to pick a Roman pope. So he flees. So in 1378, he goes back to Avignon. Now there are three popes. There is a pope in Avignon, a lackey of the French king, described by a 19th century historian as the king's vassal. There is a pope in Pisa, and there is a pope in Rome. And that all gets, and you see, now we can't tell the difference, and so these things converge again. And then it comes apart when we go to Constance in 1417, the three, well, the Pisa and the Roman pope make a deal. They agree to give it up. The pope in Avignon is reluctant. Uh, 
he is com committed in absentia of having committed heresy, uh, and he kind of you know, gets out of the picture in a hurry. And so now, now we can start to tell some differences again. All right. It's a little bit complicated. Let me see if I can simplify it. So here I'm looking at the percentage of secularly aligned bishops. I'm looking at two time periods. The black rectangles are from Council of Nicaea 325 to Avignon. The gray bars are from 325 to Martin Luther, to 1517. So we can contrast these periods. And I'm asking a simple question. This is before Worms, poor diocese, let's take the black, and before Worms, wealthy diocese. And we see there's a bit of a difference in the probability of a secular bishop and a little bit higher in the wealthier diocese. And if we look at the gray bars, we see the same thing. This is during the Worms Sauvignon interlude, poor diocese, wealthy diocese. So now if we compare, for example, during the Worms to uh, uh, Nicaea to Avignon period, this is the percentage of secular bishops in wealthy dioceses. This is in poor dioceses. You see there's a huge difference. It almost doubles. And if you contrast it to back here, it's vastly more here and even more will go out farther. That is the probability in this interlude that Wealthy dioceses get secular bishops essentially doubles from what it was before Worms. They have, in fact, responded to the changed equilibrium incentives. We see a similar picture between covered and not covered dioceses. There are indeed no wealthy dioceses with secular bishops in the not covered set. <laughs> it's zero. There's nothing there. And you know, it's this much, this, this very big percentage in the covered. And we see the same pattern across here. They have understood the changed incentives. Now you may think this is some arbitrary or lucky fall of the data. So this paper is, part of this work is co-authored with my son. This particular table was his idea, uh, as is always true. I get the credit for all the smart stuff, and actually, as it turns out, he would tell you otherwise, and he'd probably be right. But anyway, this is a really clever test. So here we start in the year 701. Here we start in the year 801. Doesn't matter. We're asking the following question. Worms to Avignon is 187 years. So we're going to ask for every 187-year interlude, starting at 701, so 701 to 888, 702 to 889, 703, blah, 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 up through 1517. We're going to ask what percentage of the bishops are religious in wealthy dioceses across each of these 187-year windows. And what, you, and what you can see is the low point for religious bishops is always in the 187-year window, Worms to Avignon. Now, it could be dumb luck, but it's starting to look like maybe this is actually what's going on, that the chances of the Pope getting guys who will do his bidding is minimized in this window. So in this window, Europe is secularizing in its wealthier places. The bishops are the agents of the secular rulers, not the agents of the church anymore. Now, as you would expect, the church does not take this lying down. So they've got some, lots of, of counter moves. Right after Worms, they either endorse or they create new entrepreneurial monastic orders. Not mendicants, not beggars. The Cistercians, they bolster the Cluniacs, the Knights Templar, folks who are not oriented towards charitable giving and begging, but towards making money. 
very different sort of monastic orders. And the Pope says, okay, you guys, you Cistercians, you're gonna go out and generate, making money, they are the, the cutting edge of technology at the time and so forth. You do not have to pay tithes to your local bishop, who now is disproportionately going to be secular, not working for the Pope. And you don't have to, you may not pay taxes to the secular ruler. You will answer directly to me. I will protect you. You will give me the money. So he has found a way to circumvent this loss of, or try to circumvent this loss of political control. He blocks secular assessments of the value of church lands because the church is very valuable and the secular rulers are now trying to figure out how to confiscate more of that wealth. And he begins to act to curtail economic development. He's got lots of ways to do this. I just have time to give you one quick example. I'll give you two. In 1123, at the First Lateran Council, they approve the Concordat of Worms and they pass a canon that says that any clergy has to be celibate. Now, you might think that this is being done because they want the clergy to be holy and pure and good things. And apparently some people at the time thought that was the idea. So they clarified it at the Second Lateran Council in 1139. What did we have in mind? The assets of a deceased cleric cannot be claimed by any family member or any knight, prince, or king. The assets belong only to the church because there can be no legitimate claimant to that property. At the Second Lateran Council, they pass a ban on usury, on lending money with the expectation of a profit, not an exorbitant profit, any profit. They can't figure out how to enforce it. They try again in 1179. They up the costs, not working. In 1215, they figure out how to do it. So in 1215, at the Fourth Lateran Council, they make annual oral confession in front of your personal parish priest mandatory for every Catholic. At least once a year, you have to go not to some, in some other parish, in your parish, to your priest, and you must confess. And they hand out confessor's manuals that contain as their text what to ask people you suspect of usury, like merchants. What is the effect of this ban? So if we look at, for example, the 50-year window before the ban and the 50-year window after the ban, and we look at expensive construction, because economics tells us that if you impose a ban on money lending, you're going to create higher interest rates. You're going to make money more expensive because it's scarcer. So I have data on castle construction. Castles are very expensive buildings. And I know whether a castle was built on behalf of a knight, a prince, a king, a secular guy, or an abbot, a bishop, an archbishop, a church guy. I also have data on the construction of churches and cathedrals. The change in the construction of secular castles, castles built for secular guys, 50 years after to compared to 50 years before, drops secular castle construction drops by 66%. Church construction, same comparison, increases by 23%. The church is not subject to the ban. The church isn't borrowing. It's, it's fabulously wealthy. The lay rulers are borrowing, and they can no longer afford it. Now. They also, by the way, remind people of passage in Luke, which they hadn't invoked for hundreds of years, that idle hands are the workshop of the devil. 
because while they are trying to constrain economic growth in the secular domain, there are huge improvements in technology, which by the way, on the monasteries that they have created, like the Cistercians, they are at the leading edge of using these technologies. The horizontal loom, the vertical water wheel, which has been imported from China, improved windmills, the spinning wheel. These are all machines that are greatly reducing labor, increasing productivity, and they are trying to restrict those to the ecclesiastical domain. Of course, kings are not taking this idly. So, for example, Henry II in England in 1166 issues four writs. Two are aimed directly at the Catholic Church, and two are aimed at increasing productivity. So, Mort en Cester and Thorin Prisonment state that the default when a serf or a tenant farmer dies is not for the land to revert to the lord of the manor, but to it remain to be used by the family. That it is the burden of the tenant, uh, excuse me, of, of the lord of the manor to prove that the family should be evicted, which was the default before. So now people have an incentive to begin to invest in the land they're farming because they expect now to be there for a long time. He passes two writs that change the judicial system. So William the Conqueror in 1066 had said the, the church decides what, courts, what cases go to the ecclesiastical court, what cases go to the secular courts. Henry says, no, 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 no. William was a fine fellow, but I decide what goes to my courts and what goes to the ecclesiastical courts. The answer to the latter was essentially nothing. And he says, we're getting rid of trial by ordeal. We're going to have trial by jury. Trial by ordeal represented 25% of the discretionary income of the Catholic Church. It wasn't small fry. You might, in the Q&A, ask me, what was the probability that you were found innocent if you had a trial by ordeal? You will find the answer very interesting. It's a game theoretic analysis with data, not by me, by an economist. OK, things are, the fight is on. In 1297, Edward I in England is fighting a war against Philip the Fair in France. A fair as in handsome, definitely not fair as in a good guy. <coughs> They're fighting in Gascony. Itself, interesting story what the fight was about. But anyway, Edward has knights in the field in Gascony and no money. They need to eat. Their horses need to eat. They need to be sheltered. They need arms. He has no money. So he goes to the lords and he says, you, are, you all owe fealty to me. I have this war going on. You have to give me money. And they say, no. This is not a war of necessity. It is a war of choice. We are not obligated to defend you in a war of choice. It's your choice. You want to fight this war? It's not to our benefit. Good luck to you. So he turns to the church. And he levies a heavy tax on the clergy. And Pope Boniface VIII, Boniface Otto, issues a bull, Clericis Laicos, or Clericis Laicos, that says that any clergy who pays taxes to the king is automatically excommunicated. I'm going to guess that the clergy were particularly likely to believe the religion, so this was a very costly thing to them. They're not paying. Edward is desperate. He's got an army in the field. He turns to the wool merchants big export business in England at the time, and he increases the tax on wool three or four hundred percent. And the wool merchants put their wool in their, you know, bundle it up and say, not paying. We're, we're not, we're not going to pay. And so Edward, because he needs the money to expand his empire, issues confirmatio cartarum. The anniversary is just one, um, uh, one day, one month away. Um, he signed this on November 17th, 1297. 
What does confirmatio cartarum say, confirmation of the charter? It goes much farther than Magna Carta. It says, from this day forward, no king of England, notice how he is now presuming that he is speaking for the country England and its government, not just for himself. No king of England ever again will levy a new tax without the approval of the lords and the commons. It is the beginning of parliament. Meanwhile, Philip the Fair in France, besides fighting his war with Edward, is also fighting a war with Boniface VIII because Boniface has issued a second bull, 1302, called Unum Sanctum. Unum Sanctum, so 1 Corinthians 2.15 says that no man can judge the church and the church judge, judgeth all. Unum Sanctum goes further, it says essentially even the lowest level clergy can depose anybody secular. Low clergy answer, so priests answer to bishops, bishops answer to archbishops, archbishops answer to the pope, the pope answers only to God, because the pope, of course, is God's choice. But any king can be deposed by the church. Philip is not keen on this, combined with the deprivation of money because he can't tax the clergy. So he calls the first ever estates general, made up of the French nobles, the French clergy, and the French commoners, or representatives of the commoners. And he can, so it's a weaker concession than in Confirmatio Cartarum, but he's creating the beginnings of some representative government. He appoints only merit-based bureaucrats to help advance his agenda. And he declares war, a holy war, on the pope. He also invokes the term duque et decorum est pro patria mori. It is sweet and proper to die for one's country. Telling Frenchmen that you should go and fight the pope, this evil guy, not as a, a Gascon, not as a Breton, not as a Burgundy person or a Norman, but as a Frenchman. And they do. They capture Boniface VIII. They imprison him. He is released. The story is murky when he is released. He dies a few days later. We are told by the church of a broken heart. We have other hypotheses as to the cause of the death, but we can't prove them. All right. So we are now beginning to see the formation of things that look like states in the battle with the church. Now, an alternative explanation is the commercial revolution, which starts in 950, 1000, according to Robert Lopez. So I have divided the dioceses of Europe into three groups. Down here, those not covered by verms. And what we are looking at here is the percentage of dioceses on trade routes based on whether they are not covered by verms, so the actual data are the triangles and the dotted dashed line is the statistical fit. It's a very good fit. Here we have the diocese covered that had religious bishops. And here we have the diocese covered that had secular bishops. So what I want you to notice is first of all, there's nothing about the theory of the commercial revolution that would make these three tranches of dioceses look different. Second, I want you to notice that they're relatively close together here. The uncovered diocese, as soon as the investiture struggle gets going, decline, they flatten out, they continue to decline during the Verms to Avignon interlude. The covered dioceses that are poor I'm sorry, that, that are, um, sec are religious, they're basically flat and then they go into decline in, in the Verms interlude. The covered dioceses that, are, that have secular bishops, so before the deal, they're bouncing up and down in terms of growth and trade routes. The deal is struck and they rise. 
I will wrap up, almost wrap up, with a still more startling image, to me at least. I have divided Europe, these are the actual data, not fitted lines. I have divided Europe, green is France. France is the wealthy country of Europe in this period. France has come to the third equilibrium outcome, right? They broke with the church. They made the, the pope work for them instead of them working for the pope. They made the pope the French king's vassal. This is what is today Roman Catholic Europe. These are the dioceses then that today are Roman Catholic. And these are the dioceses that today are Protestant. So what we see is Northern Europe, Protestant Europe, was much poorer than Southern Europe, Catholic Europe at the time. We see that just before Avignon, enough is happening that now they come to equal and overtake what is today Catholic Europe. They then get set back for a while because of the plague. Of course, these are trade routes is where the rats were transported. But what we then we see here is then it takes off. So once we get into this space, we know from the theory these are going to get these get poor and are going to get religious bishops. Somewhere in here, we're the wealthier diocese, and we're eventually going to get to the cut point. We don't know precisely where it is. We know France is beyond it, but we don't know where it happens, where you break with the church. And so what we see is after the schism is resolved, and this is a long story about what's going on, this conciliarism, the bishops become more powerful relative to the pope. What is today Protestant Europe takes off a hundred years before Martin Luther, and gets into this space where they could break with the church. So now it's only a question of having somebody with the right idea. The logic of the theory tells us that they should be stimulating growth and secularism, and both of those we see the evidence is showing us is happening. So thanks to Worms, the incentive for, to advance the interests of kings is strengthened in wealthy places, so it becomes more secular. That means that kings have an incentive to make more of their diocese wealthy, so they have more political power. And so they do. The church, meanwhile, is trying to limit economic growth. We get a more secular world. We get a wealthier northern Europe to, compared to southern Europe. And we, get all, and, and we, of course, get the Protestant Reformation. We have all of this happening long before Martin Luther. The deal has stimulated kings to create prosperity, and they have done so to gain political power, and they have set the church back where the church can't reach them, resulting in the spiritual and the temporal worlds are different spheres, which ought not to be confused and are no longer confused after verse. Thank you.